This is the M1 Abrams main battle tank. It's the backbone of the US military's ground power and a symbol of American engineering. On January 25th, 2023, President Joe Biden announced the United States would send 31 of the Abrams tanks to Ukraine. It'd be fighting Soviet T-series tanks in Eastern Europe just like its exact mission that it was originally designed for. The M1 being sent to Ukraine is like Uncle Rico going back in time to make that touchdown pass. Not only that, but the M1 tank excels in combined arms breaching. The Russian defense in depth has forced Ukraine into countless obstacle breaching engagements. These could be as complex as multi-layered minefields or as simple as a series of tank ditches. But will 31 tanks be too little too late? Which version of the tank will Ukraine receive? Will its heavy weight limit the bridges that it can cross in Eastern Europe? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Let's find out. Remember guys, tonight is your last chance to win this amazing Armasite contractor thermal site provided by our partner and small veteran owned business, getentertowin.com. With the same 640 resolution seen on US standard issue thermal optics, and it only weighs 1.93 pounds with four hours of battery life. There's even a feature that allows you to record video on here. It has a recoil rating of 50 caliber, so it's perfect for hunting trips or home security. Honestly, I wish I had the chance to keep this. I'm jealous one of you in the Spare Parts Army will get to go home with this beaut. All you have to do to get entered for a chance to win this bad boy is just click the link in the description or head over to go.getentertowin.com slash task and purpose. Buy one of our custom limited edition collectibles and you'll be automatically entered to win. But remember, the whole thing ends tonight, so head over there before midnight tonight in order to win. You must be a US resident to claim the prize. You can support my channel and the free work we consistently put out by clicking the link or head over to go.getentertowin.com slash task and purpose. Remember the deadline is tonight at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, so good luck. M1 Abrams were designed to have the endurance and survivability to withstand multiple hits in order to create space for engineering units to clear and proof a path through an obstacle belt. This being the exact capability that Ukraine needs in order to be successful against Russian formations. On May 15th, the US Department of Defense confirmed all Abrams tanks had arrived in Europe or were already there, so Ukrainian soldiers could get up to speed on training with these vehicles. The first tanks were expected to reach combat a few months later in the winter of 2024. However, on September 25th, 2023, Zelensky confirmed the tanks had arrived months early and were already on the ground in Ukraine, ready to reinforce units in the counteroffensive. This is the M1A2 tank, one of the most modern and upgraded versions of the Abrams. The type of version being sent can mean the difference between critical capabilities that often mean the difference between victory and defeat. The original intent for sending these tanks was via the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative Funding Program. This would have required the purchase of brand new M1A2 variant tanks rather than pulling from existing American formations or forward station pre-positioned stockpiles, which is exactly what was done with the Bradleys and M113 sent to Ukraine. The goal was to equip Ukraine's army with the latest possible base model of the tank to give the greatest advantage possible. However, this plan was quickly dropped in favor of providing older M1A1 stock models. The reason for this is because producing a battalion's worth of new tanks from scratch could have taken upwards of two years to complete. Since Ukrainian commanders were planning for their counteroffensive and needed more hardware on the front lines faster, they decided that older tanks were more useful now than fancy new tanks two years from now. This tells us something about the war aims of Ukraine. They want to secure as much gains as possible, as quickly as possible, because running out the clock might not be in their favor. The M1A1 isn't ancient though. Between Biden's announcement on January 25th and today, these tanks were being upgraded from American pre-positioned stocks, also known as pre-pro. Essentially, these were tanks already sitting in a European warehouse for the exact purpose of being quickly dusted off refurbished, upgraded, and sent to the front lines nearby. During the announcement, the president said, quote, 
They need to be able to counter Russia's evolving tactics and strategy on the battlefield in the very near term. They need to improve their ability to maneuver in open terrain. And they need an enduring capability to deter and defend against Russian aggression over the long term. What's interesting about this quote is that not only is the American government sending these to help push the Russians back over the border, but there's also a clear intention that these tanks are going to be there well after the war as well. This could mean that the United States is confident that the Abrams will be a continuous asset that the Ukrainians will use for the remainder of the conflict. But it also hints that this might not be the only batch that the DoD would be willing to send over. These upgraded M1s will be brought up to the M1A1 SA model. SA, in this instance, is short for Situational Awareness. The name comes from its enhanced electronic components seen on the newer A2 models as well. This is the Commander's Independent Thermal Viewer. It's attached to a thermal camera and laser rangefinder located here outside the tank on the turret. It's one of the most important upgrades added to this model. Its upgraded second generation FLIR gunner sights allows you to complete a critical concept called battle damage assessment. In the old days, you would fire off a tank round and pray to your chosen higher power that you hit something. But this was a problem because you weren't sure if you should fire again and risk wasting more ammo on a potentially destroyed target. Second generation thermal FLIR devices make it easy to see exactly the extent of the damage dealt to the enemy. The CITV edition gives the tank a separate set of eyes to see a full 360 degrees around the tank allowing the gunner and commander to simultaneously scan the surroundings at two different angles. While the alternative to this is sitting outside the hatch with a pair of binoculars and feeling the wind blow through your CVC, the persistent threat of loitering munitions and drone drop grenades means that crews are remaining buttoned up now more than ever before. Most Soviet T-Series tanks do not have thermal cameras or laser rangefinders for targeting, and this is one of the major impacts that the Abrams will bring to the front lines. In the 1970s, the Soviets were playing around with prototype thermal imagers, but the high cost and difficulties in manufacturing them for tanks resulted in not many being mass produced. This is why you see Cold War era IR beams even on Russia's modern tanks in the field today. Only the command version of the T-80U had what's called the Agava 2 IR installed, due to how expensive it was to manufacture. The Agava 2 was close to Western thermals at the same time, able to detect at three kilometers, but there's an important concept a lot of us non-tankers like to forget about known as resolving a target, which refers to how far away your fire control system can track and hit a target. Just because you can see it doesn't mean you can hit it. The M1A1 fire control system can resolve targets at over two kilometers while Soviet tech cannot. Previous M1A1 SA export models come equipped with third generation depletium uranium armor inserts. Depletium uranium is exceptionally effective in preventing Sabo tank rounds from penetrating the tank. This, however, is at the cost of protection from explosive or dual purpose ammunition, which is exactly the kind of payloads seen in most of the ATGMs and kamikaze drones. Depleted uranium is a controversial type of material that the United States only very recently approved. But what depleted uranium means is that we might see these SA models without newer third generation DU armor. However, it could work in their favor if it's replaced with additional standard composite armor instead, as this would be more effective against high explosive ammunition or vulnerable parts of the hull and turret. Tank-on-tank -tank fighting in this conflict has become exceedingly rare at this point. The overwhelming majority of combat losses stem from artillery, landmines, and the use of ATGMs by both sides, which is why this next unique capability is so crucial, specifically in Ukraine. This is the Abrams Fire Control System, attached to the 120mm smoothbore stabilized cannon that allows for accurate fire on the move at 2,500 meters distance. Many Soviet-era tanks are unable to fire while on the move and lack this high-resolution thermal imaging. The FLIR can identify targets at 16,000 meters with clear line of sight, 
which might not sound like a big deal, but the key here is that the resolution and clarity of the picture is good enough that you can actually distinguish if what you're looking at is another Abrams, Leopard tank, a Soviet T-Series tank. Vehicle identification or VID is a crucial skill for tankers that they practice by looking at various silhouettes and shapes of different armor from different angles. They have like flashcards to memorize it. Higher resolution IR means less risk of friendly fire and quicker target identification of other vehicles, which is extremely important when you're both using the same type of vehicle on both sides. The Abrams will largely face entrenched, dug-in fighting positions. One of the things I constantly see when looking through reports from the front lines is difficulty in spotting Russian ambush positions that are in tree lines and in trenches. First-hand accounts reveal that cover and concealment make it incredibly difficult to spot an enemy barely sticking out over a trench, for example. With IR, it doesn't matter how much or how little is sticking out, the crew will see a bright white hot target. There's a big controversy in the tank community about whether you should run your thermals on white hot or black hot. Rumor has it if you run your thermals on black hot, your parents probably think you're a dork. Don't even get me started on rainbow colored thermals. They're the best. It's true, these are gonna be a generation behind their American army counterparts. However, they still remain leaps ahead of any Russian armor that they would face across the front line. There's one major adjustment Ukrainian tank crews will have to make though. Unlike the Soviet tanks, the Abrams has an extra crew member. It's made up of a team of four, driver, loader, gunner, and commander. Ukraine is used to teams of three with an auto loader. This has meant that new Ukrainian crews have had to undergo specific training on crew drills that, that differ from the ones performed in T-Series tanks. The training began in late May 2023, where Ukrainian troops were spun up on Abrams tactics at two different training grounds in Germany. Soldiers were taken through gunnery, individual soldier skills, and just as equally important, on tracked vehicle maintenance. Take a look at the 420 page long Abrams maintenance manual. It's no cakewalk to keep this hunk of metal running. Pentagon Press Secretary Brigadier General Pat Ryder had this to say about keeping it operational. Certainly a key aspect of the training will be maintenance and sustainment of the capability. You've heard us talk about the fact that the M1 is a complex machine that requires a lot of maintenance to sustain it and keep it operating. So that will be crucial. Add the Abrams to the long list of different types of vehicles Ukrainian mechanics need to learn how to fix. They've adapted well, but that doesn't mean that the M1A1's maintenance requirements won't pose an issue on the battlefield. Abrams are inherently American, meaning they were designed with American logistics in mind. These tanks, like other American American tracked vehicles have parts that are meant to be replaced, not necessarily repaired. This has the benefit of allowing for more complex components on the tank without needing a PhD in tank engineering to bring your track back into operation. US maintenance relies on a steady stream of replacement parts making their way to supply depots and maintenance shops to keep our fleet of Abrams running. Unlike more common platforms like T-72s, there aren't dozens of countries with backlogs of supplies that you can quickly bring up and utilize. You can't fix the Abrams by sticking some gum on the carburetor and calling it a couple of dirty names. Abrams components are expensive, difficult to manufacture, and can only be acquired from a few choice places. Replacing these parts rather than fixing them is typically a lot simpler and requires a lot less time, but it comes at a cost. Look at the Abrams engine. It's designed to quickly be swapped in a field environment to keep formations moving. While this was a strength for the United States, it'll prove to be a weakness for Ukraine. These Abrams will be shipped with full support packages and accompanying set of spare parts, but those will only last so long. And with the M1 having thousands of individual components, the problems start to become apparent and they compound. This is why we're starting to see Western defense companies set up shop inside Ukraine despite the risks. Britain's largest defense contractor, for example, BAE Systems, has recently set up a business in Ukraine to supply arms to Ukraine and look at the future possibility of creating production facilities there. Yes, it's true. Logistics lines were quickly established in Poland, where more extensive repairs, overhauls, and maintenance have been performed by American contractors. This, however, becomes more and more difficult the further east that Ukraine pushes. Fuel becomes a concern. Abrams used the Honeywell AGT 1500C gas turbine engine rather than a standard diesel engine. This has both its drawbacks and advantages. It's multi-fuel capable engine, so it's designed to use higher quality fuels like JP8 or even jet fuel. It can run on standard run-of-the-mill diesel. 
I wouldn't recommend trying that on your personal car with different cheaper fuels. That's how I killed my 2002 Toyota Camry. Abrams are typically much louder than your standard diesel tank, and they run a lot hotter, meaning thermal and audio signatures from the Abrams will be harder to mask and camouflage. That said, these drawbacks are more than made up for in terms of capability overmatch with the longer range and improved targeting systems. Doesn't really matter how loud your engine is if you're blasting targets two miles away. It's like I always say, they can't hear us if we blow them up. This point of supporting the Abrams in the fight rather than their ability to fight has drawn the most criticism of their deployment. Just take a look at the logistics tale for the M1 Abrams. It's huge. It requires the wheeled fuel tanker, the M88 repair vehicle, additional ammunition trucks, and a portable bridge. Some of these lack the off-roading capability and survivability of the tank. You could look at the Abrams 500 gallon fuel tank that can last you 250 miles on the road. But if you're in the shoes of an Abrams commander, your planning isn't as simple as just drawing a 250 mile radius circle and calling it all good. Time to crack open an officer's rip it and call it a day. Fuel planning is broken down by both distance and more importantly, time. In a full tactical setting, simply idling the Abrams costs 30 gallons of fuel per hour and 10 gallons just to start the engine. Time between refuels factored in with distance is the primary aspect of planning with tank fuel. In Ukraine, it's likely that the fuelers will be brought up to where the tanks are or close by. It takes nearly six minutes to fuel an Abrams fully, meaning a platoon could take nearly half an hour to refuel. That's half an hour of being a really pretty target for a Russian drone operator, and half an hour before platoons of tanks are combat effective again. Supply lines are often targeted by artillery and drone strikes as they're soft, often stationary targets. Some analysts claim this is the reason why the Abrams supply chain is inherently too vulnerable in Ukraine and will suffer even more as the upcoming rainy seasons in Ukraine will limit supply mobility. Abrams Challengers and Leopard tanks have interchangeable fuel and they use the same 120 mm tank rounds for this exact reason. The entire purpose behind NATO standardization is to allow for the overlapping of supply chains. One design aspect of the Abrams left over from the Cold War that might cause problems is its weight. Back in its day, it was expected that a European war against the Soviets would be a defensive one in nature, leading tanks like the Abrams to be heavier and larger to accommodate that mission set with Soviet T-72s and T-80s being lighter, smaller, and more maneuverable. An often overlooked aspect of modern military planning is infrastructure capabilities on a given battlefield. Certain bridges and roads in rural Eastern Europe and Ukraine are simply too small or old to support the weight of a 61-ton M1A1 SA tank. The M1A2, SEP version 3, is upwards of 73.6 tons. This has caused many defense analysts to raise concerns that Abrams will be forced to choke point themselves into predictable routes or force Ukraine to establish vulnerable bridging points along wet gap crossings. For example, the current target for Ukraine's southern counteroffensive is the town of Takmak, a major railway logistical hub used by Russians to link Crimea to the rest of the defensive lines. Bisecting the town is the Takmak River, which will become completely unfordable as autumn rainfall begins within the next month. Only three bridges connect the northern half of the town to the southern half, and all could be easily blown by Russia if Ukraine begins to push out of the northern sector of the town. With water crossings proving to be deadly endeavors so far on both sides of the conflict, Ukraine will have to put extensive planning into their deployment of these 31 M1A1 tanks. That said, the A1 variant of the Abrams is lighter than both the Challenger and Leopard tanks, giving Ukrainian planners more flexibility on where they can deploy Western MBTs as the terrain becomes more difficult in the colder months. I think it's important we keep our expectations realistic given the context in which these tanks will be operating. But saying that an entire battalion of M1A1s with upgraded sensor packages is a pointless endeavor simply because there are certain logistical hurdles that'll need to be addressed is a bit overly pessimistic, I think. M1 integrations will surely add another layer to this fight and complexity, but not an impossible one. As of September 2023, only five Leopards and one Challenger tank have been confirmed destroyed by Russian efforts, mainly from anti-tank mines. 
What will prove to be the Abrams' biggest threat will be in a combination of extensive landmines with Russian Lancet drone strikes. That said, these will be older M1A1 models rather than the fancy new ones that all the Gen Z tankers get to use and run around in. And questions on the ability to perform are valid. After all, the M1A1 Abrams has not seen a war this complex or intense since maybe Desert Storm in 1991. Abrams were designed to be part of a larger joint force effort, a critical component of that being support by the American Air Force. Though the M1 was designed to be deployed with easy access to fixed wing air support, the airspace over Ukraine continues to be hotly contested. The airspace issues will work in both directions. Russia only has limited capabilities to use fixed wing hits against Abrams formations. So while Ukrainian fighters will not be covering their advances as much, that gap can be largely filled by ground-based AA batteries and man pads. Between its heavy armor, advanced sensors, and long-range capabilities, the Abrams is a significant advantage given to the Ukrainians during their current counteroffensive operations in the south and east against Russian defenses. I think General Milley put forward the best expectation of these Abrams in Ukraine when he said, quote, I'm biased, but I think the M1 tank's the best tank in the world. I do think the M1 tank, when it's delivered, will make a difference, but there is no silver bullet. This comes from the top American military advisor who back in January opposed sending Abrams to Ukraine due to the complexity of the logistics train, but now believes that they can make a tangible effect on the operations moving forward. And ultimately, it's another piece of the puzzle pushing Russia out of Ukraine. I'm your average infantryman. Follow me at Cappy Army on Instagram. Check out one of these two new videos if you get a chance, and I'll see you guys again soon.